Hello and welcome to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck and I get to travel throughout Southern Oregon, Northern California, meeting the most fascinating people. I'm not the only one that's out there anxious to meet the people with stories. And that's where my guest today connects. Welcome, welcome to the show. And you Thank are? Thank you, Bernie. I'm Wayne Morrow. Wayne, how did it happen that you're interested in history? Well, I guess it's kind of an outgrowth of the high school subject of English and journalism that I taught. Now, you're a teacher. I'm a retired teacher. Retired, I like yes. that word. Two and a half years. Of retirement after how many years of teaching? I taught 36 years at Grants Pass High School. Wow, my hat's off to you. Thank you. Um, what, you taught journalism? Yes, that was my minor at uh, Oregon State University. My well, major was English. And so when uh, I got hired at Grants Pass High School, they offered me the job of teaching journalism too. So I did, and I also became the advisor of the scroll. That's the newspaper on campus. Now, you say Oregon State University. Was that the name of it back then? Yes, it was. Oh, he's a little bit younger. I can it see that. It had changed <laughs> from Oregon State College. Which state changed from Oregon State Agricultural. OAC, <laughs> that's right. So now it's a university. <clears throat> well, your alma mater, and uh, we spent a little time there. My husband, uh, after the GI, you know, Korea, he went on the GI Bill and finished his education there. So I got to go along for a few months, okay. learn the way, because we're here talking about war and veterans and things like that. How did you, is it your history connection that, that or you just always love to learn about history of wars? No, actually it kind of grew um, maybe the last five years of my teaching and I was going over a short story in just one of, in one of the English classes, and I had a group of sophomores, and they were uh, we were talking about discussing this short story that involved uh, you know a human reaction to war and the toll it takes on them, and and I had two uh, sixteen-year-old boys sitting right in front of me. I remember them, and you know how sixteen-year-old boys are. They know everything. Aha. Uh -huh. And um, so we were talking about it, and uh, they said, boy, you know what, if we had been in that war, we'd have, this is what we'd have done. We'd done this, this and that. We'd have taken care of those Germans. And, you know, they were going on, and I was just smiling because I'm thinking, you guys, you have no idea what you're talking about. Not wet behind so the ears. And so I finally told them. I said, fellas, you know, I was not in World War II. But... I can tell you that you have no idea what you're talking about. And um, so I decided, I think it was a day or two afterwards, I thought, you know, it'd be a good education for the kids. You bet. Get a World War II veteran in there, tell them what it was really like, and just answer questions. Run it like a press conference. And they can fire the questions at them, and they probably will learn. So I went and got a veteran. Uh, he was uh, a Navy. Uh, an enlisted man in the Navy and had been in 92 kamikaze oh, attacks my. on his ship. And it and turned out to, to tell be a story. really uh, an interesting thing. And so then I got a few more people to come in. And what I decided to do was just go ahead and videotape their talking about it. And I used a, a microphone so the sound is very clear. And I had one of the kids who could run a the camcorder, go ahead and record it. Then when I got through, the librarian at our school said, hey, those last three guys you did, just give me the tape, I'll make a copy of it and give it to them for their family. So I started doing that. When that got out, I started getting phone calls. Hey, I want to talk on your, <laughs> to your class. No, it wasn't I, it was my dad. He needs to do that. Would you do that with him or my grandpa? or my husband. I, I think it was mostly kids and the wives of the men. Although I had two ladies 
come in that were in the Marines. Well, and mostly those guys have been kind of tight-lipped about their some of them experience. Some of them are the ones that are tight-lipped are years? very tight-lipped. For fifty years. Yeah. Or and no, it's longer than that. Well, it's sixty now, the forties, and at so, that time so it was. So you guys are eighty something. My hat's off to you. So I, I ended up. I had so many calls, and I started. I think it was in about May. And by the end of the school year, uh, I just ran out of time. There were more people to do. But see, I had six classes, so I could bring one in for one class, and one for another, and one for another. And it turned out to be just a, a real, a, a tremendous thing. I ended up with 26 and one World of, War II veterans coming in. And one in. of those veterans was a friend of Better Life Television that now I just found out mm -hmm. you'd interviewed Olin Nations. Yes, he was one that, that came, one of the 26, and I can't even remember what the occasion was. Uh, somebody said, call him up, or I got a phone call from somebody, and I said, well, okay, come on down, we'll work in. I'll tell you, his story is interesting because he was an early non-com, and there weren't, you know, non-combatants. They aimed at him instead of mm. aimed away. Uh-huh. And um, his story's been here on Journeys and Journals, too, and we surely appreciate it. Now, you know, we've come a long way around to know that you like Oregon history, and I brought the Oregon history book a hundred years in right. pictures. Um, right now, I'm going to ask you to picture in your mind what it was like when war was over in your town, maybe not in Southern Oregon, but any place. Now, are you old enough to remember the excitement why here of in- the end of World War II? Uh-huh. Uh, actually, I, I really searched my brain a lot, and I only have uh, a couple of refl memories, but they're very vivid, of World War II. The first one was, I think I was about, five or six years old and uh, somebody, it may have been my dad or somebody said, well, I want to tell you boys that the, uh, uh, your Uncle Harold was killed. He was in a P-38 and he was killed in the war. And it, I remember that, although I don't think it really hit me like it did the older again. ones. And then I remember in 1945, one day I was just going around the house and mom was crying. And I asked my brother, I said, what's the matter with mom? He said, the war's over, just real quick like that. And, and that sunk in. Those are my two memories of it, really. Well, I can remember we planted victory gardens in the rows in the shape of oh. bees. We saved tin cans and fat. And we saved, if you wanted a new record, you took a broken record or you took a uh, you had to bring things back, recycle all kinds of things mm -hmm. here in Grants Pass. And then the story I love is when at Victory, people closed their shops and went out in the street and hollered and honked. <laughs> Did they? And in Medford, they um, got these big um, lumber carriers, the kinds that have wheels and then the driver sits way up about second story. Oh, sure, yeah. And those were going up and down, hong, you know, the, in this parade. Yeah. So it was a really exciting time mm -hmm. in our world. What was it like with the veterans you've talked to when war was over? Well, it was um, relief, mostly looking just to get home and get on with life. Uh, there wasn't, I don't think with them there was a, a long period of celebration or anything. It just, you know, they'd been, they'd been through an awful lot and they, they had their lives to get on with. And when they got back, that's exactly what they did. You know that the World War II generation, Tom Brokaw said the, the, the greatest generation, and he's right, that's exactly where they were. Not only did they take on uh, Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany and put a halt to that, which was uh, world domination, but then they came home 
and we had just come out of uh, about 10 years of depression, and they put this country back on their feet just by doing what, what uh, came natural to them, and that is get a job, they get married, they start their families, and let's get on with it, and they, they really put the country back together. That's why I'm so proud of you for what you're doing, because you are telling the rest of the story. You are telling, you know, they came back and went to work. They didn't write books. I mean, when did Tom Brokaw write his book? <laughs> 50 years later, right? Right, right. They didn't take time to reflect about poor me or ain't it awful or any of those things. No, there was no complaining. They didn't complain gosh, I, I had a wound, or they took three years of my life, and I lost my, they just, they did the, it was actually the same attitude that they went into the war with. Uh, I, I'm here to do a job, do it the best that I can and get it with. You know, if there's one word that you do not want to use that I learned around a World War II veteran, don't call them a hero, because none of them look at themselves as being a hero. They just, no. Uh, I did what I was expected to do, and so it came very natural. They will tell you the real heroes are the ones that did not come back. That is an accurate term for them. Yeah, because there were lots of caskets covered in the 48. Right. But we waved it high. <laughs> All right. I'm interested in... How does this connect with retirement? I mean, you're a teacher, you've interviewed all these people, now you are a rocking chair. I mean, there's, you know, you don't even have to worry about journalism. Well. But it's in your blood? Um, yes, <laughs> I, I think it is. But in addition to that, this opportunity came along. One of the men who came in and spoke to the class and I'd never met him before, but I had a friend, uh, Walt Ferris, that said, you know, you, uh, you should get this guy Maury Saunders in. He's got stories. So I invite, he came in, and of all of the people, I would say that he, you, he had, they all had unique stories, but his was kind of one step above, a very colorful type person also. Well, isn't he kind of bigger than life, too? Um, I just saw him as we were doing our interview. He, he just seemed to fill up the whole space. Well, he, he's a, he is still a big man, but when he was in the service, he was 6'3", 240 pounds. Sure, uh, he, bigger than life. It's just, yeah. a, in, I mean, I can see why you would say, hey, let's talk a little more. Is that how it went? Um, or am I skipping not exactly. the whole? <laughs> it, uh, he came and spoke to the class. And I, I really liked the guy. Well, then I retired in 2002. I graduated. Uh, I'm in the class of 02. <laughs> in fact, I graduated from Grants Pass High School twice, also in 56. Oh. But then I thought, well, uh, I want to join one organization in Grants Pass that serves the community, just one. And I had friends suggest some to me. Uh, and then I thought, you know, the, I have such a special place in my heart for World War II veterans that, and a couple of them had come in class, and I found that the Golden Eagles Kiwanis are made up almost entirely of men who have served in World War II and, and or Korea. So I went down and checked them out and uh, joined them, and so we're doing these service projects. We meet every Wednesday morning at 7.30. We have a breakfast at the Vitality Center. And then we go in and have a meeting with a speaker. Well, well that, that was right down your alley. These yes. seniors are oh. part of your comfort zone. Boy, just be having a little breakfast and somebody, and I just ask them, hey, uh, where were you when they dropped the atomic bomb? Do you remember that on Hiroshima? And boy, the stories come flying. But one morning, I happened to be sitting just next to Maury. Maury told me a story, and I said, Maury, you need your stories of World War II. You need to get them down in print, or at least on tape, for your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids and for 
and you know kids that haven't even been born yet they you got to get it and he said you know you sound a lot like my kids they have been yeah. on me to do this but he said i wouldn't know what to do and i just thought for about five full seconds and i said okay <laughs> hmm. maury let's you and i do it i'm a journalism teacher and i and appreciate I world this, war ii veterans and i know the skills that it takes so to do what you don't know and you know what i don't know yeah i said you got the stories and i think i can write halfway decent and so let's team up halfway decent folks <clears throat> look at the results of that story i mean page after page now this is not first draft i loved what you told me about you went to his place with a tape recorder, right? Yes. Then you'd go home? I would go, well, every Wednesday morning after the Kiwanis meeting was over, we would go to his house, which is out in Colonial Valley, sit down at the dining table. I'd get out my tape recorder so that I wouldn't have to take notes. And so I'd be, accuracy was so important to me. And I told Maury from the start, I said, listen, I may end up driving you nuts for getting details, but I want it. it's got to be totally accurate. And then I would go home, and within 48 hours, I tried my best to sit down and write that stuff. Because as a journalism teacher, I told the kids, if you take notes, you hear a speech or anything, don't wait a week and then try and write it, because you're writing from cold notes. Write it right then. So I instilled that in myself. And I would write it. Then next week we'd go back and I would show him what I wrote. I'd leave it with him for a week. And he, I'd say, clean it up. Anything that's not right, let me know. And he would. And so well, we did he that. He had a red pencil. Yes. And over and over again. So it was read, rewritten, and rewritten. Right. So we ended up with about 10 months of uh, me going up there to his place. And I ended up with... Uh, the little cassette tapes, I, I got 49 of them, both sides totally recorded. 49 tapes there in a book. Now, what are these pictures? Is this the early years? Yes, those are in the early years, this particular one. Pioneer here. days. These are his grandparents. They were immigrants from Sweden. And this is where he was raised. Uh, he was actually born and raised in the little town of El Waco, which is at the mouth of the Columbia River on the Washington side. Ah. Grew up there, and that one is of him in an old, real old car. I don't even Now, Waco, as I understand it, is a town without a, much of a road? Uh, you, yes, it's very small, very you small You can't town. get there, ex I mean, it was a, uh, really, you got there by sea, didn't you, or by Back in river? those days, back in those days you did. It was kind of landlocked, like, uh, well, he had a career um, before he went in the military, right? He was, he was an active kid doing stuff. Well, actually, he went to college for about a year and a half, University of Washington. And he went up there, and part of the time was to play some football. But he didn't big. know anything. He had no skills. He didn't have a coach that taught him anything. So, but he was big. He was just a big kid. And um, well, then, big kids should play football. I'm sure that was the slogan then too. Right. And then uh, he came home, and then decided that uh, this was in about March of 1941. He decided that he would go into the army, into the infantry, for one year because in those days. You'd get drafted sooner or later, but he thought, I'll go in on my terms, and sure. I, I'll go in for one, my one year. Well, we all six know or seven months happened. later, Pearl Harbor happened, and he never got out. But he had this very unusual circumstance happen where a, a, an enlisted person could have a try at being a pilot. It was called the Sergeant Pilot Program. Oh, because they needed... They, pilots, they were, instant yes. pilots. And they were looking for good ones, and, and he passed everything with flying colors. Well, there he is, right? Yeah, that's Didn't, right. Isn't that neat? This is in his training. Uh, this guy is teaching him to, a little, like a fighter plane, 
and this is a B-26 bomber that he flew, and he's just getting ready to go to North Africa at that point. Well, now, what did the guys at Golden Eagle say about what you've done for Maury, what Maury's done for you? I mean, are you the talk of the group? <laughs> well, uh, I think they all said they uh, appreciated what was done. Most of them said, but this is partly because they know Maury, they, they said, I read it twice. And the, it, it is in depth uh, on World War II. It's quite a bit of depth about the Depression. Uh, people who have been in the Air Force seem to really pick something out. It means a lot oh, to them. Oh, look at even those planes. Aren't those enough to just, you can almost hear the newsreel telling you the stories of yeah. World War II. Well, the bottom one is the, the Martin Marauder, the B-26. He was the pilot. There were five other crew members. Um, 66 missions over Italy, southern France, and uh, five or six times he was shot down. One time he uh, was the only survivor in the plane. Another time half the crew was killed and he was in the half that made it. He had to put down in the Mediterranean and it's uh, a very unique story. But the Golden Eagles, this is the group that here they have. The Kiwanis. Yeah, right. And they're helping kids all over the place. That's right. There are three Kiwanis groups in town, Grants Pass, Caveman, and the Golden Eagles. And how Eagles. many in Southern Oregon, Northern California? Do you imagine there, every town has one or two or three or four? Exactly. And they're out there to help kids. But uh, there's, uh, we had a, a Veterans Day uh, little honorary program for them in November and uh, myself and one other person put it on and we recognized all of them but there are 15 uh, fellows in there and they've served Normandy and Guadalcanal and the Pacific and uh, CBI the China Burma India theater and it's just they're they are just a down-to-earth but special group of men so if you get the idea, I'm encouraging you to talk to the neighbor, talk to a friend, talk to grandpa, do it. Now, this newspaper article just shocks me, but it doesn't really. Why does the CIA interested in a Roseburg airplane? Do it's I have not that an right? airplane, but it's a lady up there in Roseburg. Her father disappeared in 1952 while making a flight uh, that they said out of Japan and it didn't went down. Didn't exist? No, they, they it, actually it was a cover story, and, but it was already decided and, and probably they were told, listen, if you guys, if anything happens to you, you disappear. We're just gonna say you went down, you were lost at sea. That's what they were told. And now, is that part of Maury's story? Yeah, yes. Oh, kind of. <laughs> uh, indirectly, because he was told roughly the same thing. So here it is in the newspaper because somebody um, wasn't under a gag order or whatever you call well, it. Well, two, uh, two bodies were found by, you know, there's a POW, a MIA group. Right. And they located some in China. And uh, the Chinese government said, okay, you can come and get the bodies, but the only way you can do it is you have to admit that, that, those, that that plane with those two people were on spy missions over China. Flying ch over China. Over China instead of going to Korea. And um, the CIA said, okay, we'll admit it. So bring, the bring body... On. The, the two bodies were returned, and by now, I think probably that lady has given her father a, a real burial. But So some of the things that Maury was involved in came out because of this article. Not because of your book, but no. there's so much detail in this book, folks. Um, and they can find you at the local bookstores or signing <laughs> Actually, books or... Uh, 
from time. Yeah, probably just a phone call to me or something because uh, I'm not out uh, trying to sell the book. In fact, well, there were only 400 copies and, and I sell them real cheap because I, I was not interested in making money by selling a book. Okay. My feelings are if a person will read that book and when they get to the end of it, they say to themselves, boy, World War II veterans, we really owe them a word of thanks, and that's my reward. Absolutely right. And my hat's off to them. My goodness, they came home, rolled up their sleeves, and went to work. That's right. Well, I'm looking forward to that meeting again with Maury. We had a wonderful tete-a-tete in uh, advance of this over lunch with your wife, his, his, his wife, wife, Lois. And we'll have him on, Lord willing, in the near future to tell the rest of the story. Right. Because you've just whet our appetite. <laughs> and we're, um, there you guys are. You mean that's the way it worked? That's how you write a book? That's what it looked like at his dining room table. The tape recorder is there, a couple of books, one on B-26s, another one on B-47s. But it was, it was a lot of work, but it was, it was rewarding and fun. And when you meet Maury, you'll understand. Now, he's how old? 85. You just got to go to a party for Maury, right? Yes, it was uh, his... He and Lois were married 60 years on Valentine's Day. Oh. See, he just got home from the war. Two weeks later, they got married Valentine's Day, 45. And the kids put on this thing out at a big kind of celebration, and it was fun being there. It's time to celebrate. And I thank you for putting this story down for history, but also to honor Maury, and I look forward to having him, to meeting with him again, and and sharing his story from his perspective. You've done a good job. Well, and I thank you. And I want to thank you. Folks, write down those stories. Talk them into a tape recorder. Tell Grandma and Grandpa you love them. Thanks for tuning in to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck saying bye for now. <laughs>